That's it. Okay. Thanks, Matteo, for your kind words. <coughs> I'm uh, honored and, and humbled uh, by this prestigious invitation to come and uh, give a series of lectures on uh, random matrix theory, which is the um, field I entered about 12 uh, years ago and which still um, surprises and, and amuses um, me. I have uh, prepared a couple of handouts. There are some spare copies um, here. One is on, uh, let's say, the history of the, of the subject. There are some original papers and some curiosities. So, and the other one is about numerical, uh, numerical simulations. So um, I hope that uh, together they will uh, help us um, form a uh, no round view of of the uh, of the field from from multiple and different perspectives. Um, I, in preparing these lectures, I uh, assume that while most of you may have heard about random matrix theory, um, probably none of you has have none of you has received uh, like a formal training uh, on it, um, and you haven't worked on on research problems in in there. So if this assumption is not turns out not to be correct then we can, we can tweak the, uh, the pitch a bit. Um, so in, in summary, although I, my aim is to cover pretty advanced material in the end, I will try to start as smoothly and, and softly as, uh, as possible. Um, in, um, in essence, random matrix theory is the uh, happy marriage between linear algebra and probability, probability theory. And the, the fundamental, so let me, so random matrix theory, commonly denoted RMT, uh, well, we can say is the sum of linear algebra and probability theory. In, uh, in essence, the, um, the main problem of, of random matrix uh, uh, theory can be formulated in extremely simple um, terms. If I give you, uh, let's say, a matrix X, which is of size N by N, This matrix is described by a certain joint probability density for the entries. So we, we have a, a matrix with, with random entries described by a certain joint probability density. And out of this uh, input, we would like to say something about the eigenvalues. Okay, so this is the, the, the general setting of, of random matrix theory. I give you a matrix with random entries and I want to say something about the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this matrix. Good. So, um, of course, I could, in principle, uh, spend a lot of time trying to convince you that this type of setting is very useful. It, it comes up naturally in many, uh, in many different fields. Um, but actually, I am decided to follow another, uh, another route. So experience has taught us that sooner or later, everyone comes across a random, a random matrix. OK? So uh, I, I will let time work for, for me, and I will just focus on giving you some, some tools, um, so a no frills account on how to do calculations on random matrices, okay? I will skip all the motivation part, because it is boring, and because you will learn yourself that random matrices are useful without me telling you this. Good. So the first calculation that we can do, the simplest and most basic calculation, which is at the same time very instructive, uh, has to do with two by two. Sorry? Okay. 
two by two random matrices. Let's call it spacing distribution. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, is very simple. We have a two by two matrix, x1, x2, x3, x3. So this is a real symmetric matrix. These two elements are identical. And we take x1 and x2 as Gaussian random variables with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so they are taken from the probability density function one over root two pi exponential minus one half x square. And we take the off diagonal, so these, these elements are all independent, these three elements. And the off diagonal element, we take it as uh, Gaussian with mean zero and variance one half. So it is taken, the off diagonal element is taken from a PDF of this type. Now, you might already start asking, okay, why are we picking the, the variance of the off-diagonal element equal to one-half the variance of the diagonal elements? There's a quite deep reason uh, behind it, and I will try to explain why we, we do this. But other than that, other than this simple um, uh, difference, uh, the setting is pretty, pretty simple, okay? Now, what is, the, what is the question? I want to compute the probability density function of the spacing, the spacing S between the two eigenvalues. So if this one is the largest eigenvalue and this one is the smallest eigenvalue, I take the difference between the two and I want to compute the probability density function of this object. Clearly, this, this object S is a random variable because the eigenvalues are random variables since the entries of your random matrix of your matrix are, are random. Okay. So you have the two eigenvalues. They are real because the matrix is uh, real symmetric. And I want to compute the probability density function of this object. Excellent. So, well, if we don't have man, more uh, sophisticated tools, the only thing we, we can do is to compute the characteristic equation, compute the eigenvalues of this object in terms of, of the entries, Sorry. compute the uh, characteristic function, compute the eigenvalues in terms of the, of the entries, compute the, the spacing, and then try to work out the probability density function. Okay. Can I raise uh, here? Good. So the characteristic equation for a two by two matrix has a particularly simple form. <coughs> so it is a second degree uh, equation, lambda square minus the trace of x times lambda plus the determinant of, of x. So in this, in, in this case, the trace of x is just x1 plus x2. And the determinant of x is x1, x2, minus x3 square. From which you can compute the uh, two eigenvalues, which are 1 half x1 plus x2 plus minus root of x1 plus x2 square minus 4 x1, x2, minus x3 square. So from, from this expression, we can compute lambda 2 minus lambda 1, so the spacing between the two. So the spacing between the two eigenvalues is lambda 2 minus lambda 1. It will be just given by the square root, which we can simplify to be x1 minus x2 square, 
plus 4x3 squared. Okay, so from, from this point uh, onwards, we can forget that this object came from a random matrix problem. Okay? So in, in essence, what we have is a function of three random variables, x1, x2, and x3, and we want to compute the probability density function of this object given the probability density function of the original variables. Okay? We can f completely forget that this object came from a random matrix problem. Now, <clears throat> how do we compute the PDF of this object? Well, we, we just apply basic properties of functions of random variables. So what we have is <clears throat> that the PDF of S will be given by what? It will be given by the integral over the PDF of the three variables. So this one as root 2 pi, this one at a root 2 pi, this one at a root pi. Then we have exponential of minus 1 half x1 squared plus x2 squared. And then we have an exponential of minus x3 squared without the 1 half, because you remember there was a factor 1 half in the, uh, between variances of, the, of these objects. And then what I can do is I will stick in a delta function that enforces the fact that S, the definition of S. This is going to be tricky. Okay, so the definition of S is root of x1 minus x2 square plus 4x3 square. So this, this expression gives the probability density function of a function of three random variables given the joint distribution of these three variables. So if we are able to perform this uh, integration, we'll, we'll have our, our answer. Now, this uh, integration can be, uh, if, you, if you notice this structure, we have a, square, a sum of two squares here. So the, the natural thing to do is to go uh, to po polar uh, coordinates in a certain combination of x1, x2, and, and x3. So the, the, the right change of variable is probably x1 minus x2 will be r cos theta. We will have two x3 should be r sen theta. And then we can use x1 plus x2 equal to psi. This will um, help us in the, uh, in the calculation. Okay? So we, we make this, this change of variable in, in this, this integral. So this change of variable gives rise to this inverse change of variable. So now we all know that we need to compute the Jacobian of this change of variable and express the integrand in terms of the new, of the new variables. Uh, if we do that, the Jacobian is given by the partial derivative of x1 with respect to r, partial derivative of x1 with respect to theta, partial derivative of x1 with respect to psi, and the same thing for the other variables. So 
you can you can work this out. I just give give you the answer. This is cos theta over two minus r half sin theta. One half minus cos theta over two r theta over two one half sin theta over two r cos theta over two and zero. You can check it easily by taking the partial derivatives of the of this scheme here. And then all you, all you have to do is to compute the determinant of this, of this object. So if you compute the determinant of the Jacobian, you get that the determinant of j is minus r over 4. So all the angular dependence drops out. And we will have to take, of course, the absolute value of this, of this object. OK. So if we do that, this is just simple algebra. You need to take derivatives of this object and compute the 3 by 3 determinants. So I will not spend more time on it. OK. So what we have here is that p of s is equal to what? Is equal to 1 over 2 pi root 2 pi times root 2 pi. And here we have a root pi. Okay. Then we have a factor 1 fourth coming from the, from the Jacobian. So we put in here a factor 1 over 4. And then we have the integral over r, which is the radial variable. The integral over theta, which goes from 0 to 2 pi. And the integral over psi, which remember was the sum of x1 and x2. And so the range of this object is minus infinity to plus infinity. Then what we have here is the absolute value of the Jacobian, which is r, because one fourth has been already taken care of. So we, we stick in here an extra r. Then we have a delta function here of s minus this combination here is root of r squared, so it is just r. And that's where the simplification comes, comes from. And then we, we will need to rewrite this object in terms of the uh, new integration variables. So if we do that, you get exponential of minus 1 half. So we have x1 square, which is r cos theta plus psi over 2 square, plus psi minus r cos theta over 2 square. And then we have, we, we've taken out a factor 1 half, so we add 2 times r square over 4 sine square of So this one is x1 square, x2 square, and this one is x3 square, but there was a, f a factor 1 half missing, so I'm correcting for it. So now this is the integral we, we have to, to solve. Uh, we are, of course, uh, helped a lot by this uh, delta function. So using this delta function, we can kill one of the uh, integrals, the r integral, and exchange every occurrence of r with an occurrence of s. So if we do this, uh, if we perform this uh, calculation, yes. No, because you need to take the absolute value of the of the Jaco of the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, right? Because the, the change of the change of measure between two integration region cannot cannot have a negative signature, right? Because otherwise you are mapping positive regions into negative regions. Okay. 
So the determinant is minus r over, over 4, but you need to take the absolute value of it. Okay. So from here, we have equal 1 over 2 pi root pi times 1 over 4. And then we use this delta to kill the r integral. So we get a factor of s here. Okay. But we need to be careful because the integration over r is between 0 and infinity. Okay. So when we use the delta function to kill this integral, we also need to impose that r, s should be between 0 and infinity. So s should be positive. This is clear because s physically is the difference between the largest and the smallest eigenvalue. So it, it has to be positive. So we can put a theta function here, which means that s must be positive. So then we kill the uh, theta, uh, sorry, we kill the, the r integral. And we are left with two integrations of this type, exponential minus 1 half. And then I just write s square cos square theta plus psi square plus 2s psi cos theta over 4. This is the first, the first bit here, where I replace s here and expand the square. Plus psi square plus s square cos square theta minus 2s psi cos theta over 4 plus s square over 2 sine square theta okay so I'm just expanding the squares there and replacing uh, every occurrence of R with an occurrence of s and, and then it's just a matter of uh, algebra to just sum these uh, bits up. For example, you see that there is a cancellation, like this guy here and this guy here uh, cancel, cancel out. Uh, and then we have, yes, so, sorry? Any question? No. Okay. Can I raise here? So after a bit of algebra, I just we get 1 over 2 pi, root pi, 1 over 4. Then we have s, theta of s. Then we have an exponential of minus s squared over 4 here. And this, uh, this comes from, from these bits. So we have s squared cos squared theta plus s squared cos square theta, so this is a 2 s square cos square theta divided by 4, so it is 1 half, which uh, combines exactly with this object. So cos square theta plus sine square theta is equal to 1, and the theta dependence drops out. Uh, note that this can only happen because we took the variance of the off-diagonal elements to be 1 half of the variance of the diagonal elements. So had we taken the variance equal between the two, then the theta dependence wouldn't have dropped out. And we, we, would, we would get still an integral over theta to perform, which would give rise to a Bessel function. Okay? So only because of this factor of, uh, of two, we can uh, simplify the theta, the theta dependence. Okay? But this is not the end of the story. So this factor of two has much deeper um, consequences. Okay? We, will, we will see um, later. Okay, so then we have the theta dependence becomes trivial. Okay, so this is just a factor of 2 pi. And then the psi dependence is also easy. 
so we have exponential of minus psi squared over 4, which is just a Gaussian integral giving rise to root 4 pi. So the integral is, uh, is done, and if you absorb all the constant, we get that p of s is for basically s positives, um, s over 2 exponential or minus s squared over 4. So this is the final, the final result. This is the probability density function for the spacing of a 2 by 2 Gaussian random, random matrix. Okay, so let's, uh, let's plot it. So you see that for s going to 0, this object goes to 0 linearly. So it goes like this. It goes up, and then the exponential decay wins, and so it goes to, to 0. So this is the, the shape of the probability distribution, probability density function for the eigenvalues of a 2 by 2. Yeah. If the mean values were different, so we couldn't have a Gaussian. I mean, you chose the uh, the same mean value, so you can have the. Final yeah. Uh, so if, if you if you pick if you pick the, the variance of, of all the elements like uh, different from, from, from each other, then you wouldn't get this this the simple the simple form. Okay. But there would be a way to rescale the the final result in such a way that that all the results would, would fall on top of the same universal curve, OK? So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a, bit, a bit trickier. Uh, you're talking about the mean, right? The mean value. Yeah, so the mean value is not that important. The variance is, is crucial. So you can do something to uh, make the mean same? Yes, yes. You can, you can, you can do it. Normally, you don't, you don't do it just because it, it makes the calculation more difficult without adding anything. But the variance is, is crucial. So the choice of the variance is, is more crucial. Now, this, this curve that, that we have just computed is so important in, in random matrix theory that it, it has a, a name. So it is named after one person who contributed a lot uh, on, uh, on the field of random matrices. So this is called a Wigner's surmise. Bigner surmise. Okay, and now uh, here comes the first. Um, well, you can find you can find something on the Bigner surmise in the uh, in the handbook in the first pages of the of the handbook uh, of the. Um, so here's a paper by Wigner on page two of the handbook where he basically did exactly the same calculation. That I that I was doing here. So it's page two. Yeah. Well, I mean, th this one was just was just toy model to. Uh, it's hard it's hard to tell what kind of practical problems you would like to solve with, with a two by two Gaussian Gaussian random matrix. I chose this example just because it is very instructive and it tells you a lot about how to perform calculations and what type of information you get about eigenvalues of, of larger matrices. So typically when you, when you cannot do uh, a calculation for an n by n matrix, the, the, the best thing you can do probably is to go to a two by two case, try to work it out and then try to infer what would happen for, for, larger, for larger matrices. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this example as a true representative of the type of problems that we encounter every day, but this this Wigner surmise tells us a lot about what happens in general. That's why I chose this this example. Okay, I would I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay, so um, the the reason why it is called Wigner surmise. So this is one of the first uh, examples where the the name given to things. Uh, is not really uh, appropriate, and and in random matrix theory, this is uh, this happens uh, all the time. So surmise in in English, surmise means to think or infer without certain 
or strong evidence. This is just taken from the dictionary. Without certain or, or strong evidence. So it is, it is hard to, to speculate why it is called a, a surmise, given that it comes from an exact calculation. Okay. Now, it is called a Wigner surmise because the, the story was that Wigner was attending a, a certain conference on neutron scattering, and, uh, and people asked a question about what would be the, the typical spacing of resonances in, in, a scatter, in a neutron scattering experiment. And then he just walked up to the blackboard, and he wrote basically this, this formula, and was like, I think it, sh it should be like this. And then from, from that moment onwards, it is called a Wigner surmise, even though there is no surmise. I mean, it comes from, from an exact calculation. Okay? But you will, you will read it uh, all the time, so I thought I should, uh, you know, I should point, this, uh, point this out. Now, what is this uh, uh, picture telling us? This is a very instructive uh, point. You see, the really important region is, is this one. Okay? Why? Because for s going to 0, the probability density function goes to 0. So it, it means that the probability of finding two eigenvalues that are very close to each other goes to 0. It means that the two eigenvalues don't like to stay too close to, to each other. Okay? So one eigenvalue feels the presence of the other. This is quite striking, because we started off from a matrix with independent entries. So the entries are independent. They don't talk to each other. But the eigenvalues do, because the second eigenvalue doesn't like to stay too close to the first one. Okay? So this is a very, uh, very important point that survives also for larger n, and it is called level repulsion. So the eigenvalues of random matrices generally, not just for 2 by 2 and not just for Gaussian uh, measure, don't like to stay too close to each other. They also don't like to stay too far away from, from each other. But this is less, you know, less, less striking. The most important thing is that they talk. They talk to each other, even though the entries are, are independent. If, if you want an analogy, you can think of the eigenvalues as, for example, birds that are perching on, on an electric wire or parked cars on, on, on a lane. You don't like to stay too close to the car ahead of, of, of you. You don't like to stay too, too far away when, when, you, when you park. And that, of course, you might think, OK, this is totally crazy. This analogy doesn't, doesn't work. But if you go on page 3, actually, people, went, people measured the Wigner surmise in the position of birds that are perching on, on, a, on an electric wire and in the, in the distribution of spacing between parked cars. And they found a very good agreement. Okay? So um, don't read too much into, into it. Um, I think I've, I've heard uh, a story that the guy who did this experiment with parked cars was actually questioned by the police. <laughs> because he, he tried to measure the spacing of parked cars and were like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to demonstrate the Wigner surmise. And they were like, yeah, yeah, come with us. <laughs> Good. So this is a very, uh, this is a, a very important uh, point, a very important feature of uh, random matrices is that eigenvalues do repel. Okay? They, they talk to each other, even if the entries are, are independent. Excellent. Uh, now, just to, um, OK, well, um, just to complete the picture, can I uh, erase? Here. Yeah. Ah, of course, uh, I forgot to tell you. In the uh, clearly in the in the other handout, the one on numerical simulations, you can of course test this prediction very very easily. So I did it like in MATLAB. You can easily generate a two by two uh, matrix, diagonalize it, compute the eigenvalues, and put and, and, and compute a histogram of the of the spacing, and, and what you get is is exactly the uh, the the, the beginner surmise uh, shape. This is on page three of the uh, of the other handout. So so you see that the number of events where two eigenvalues are very close to each other is is negligible. Okay? It's vanishingly small. Now to uh, 
of course, we, we, we should compare actually this situation with what happens um, in the case of IAD random variables. So if, if you take independent, may possibly identically distributed random variables, which is not the case of the eigenvalues, okay? So the, I, the independence here is on the entries, not on the eigenvalues. But if you take truly independent random variables, what would be the distribution of the spacing? Let's, let's compare the two, the two cases, okay? And, and we will appreciate the difference. So in this situation, um, the calculation, so we, we can perform a, a calculation that is quite general, so it doesn't depend on the distribution of the individual random variables. And so I must say, just to uh, motivate you a bit, that although I search for a long time for this type of derivation, the one that I'm going to, to do now, I failed to find a single reference where this calculation was, was performed in full details from top to bottom. So, so what I'm telling you is, so I'm giving you a gift. <laughs> that you will not find this derivation anywhere. Or probably you will, and I was just stupid and I couldn't find it, okay? Okay, so just for comparison, what is the, the law for the spacing of IID uh, random variables? So the, um, the setting, uh, everybody knows what IID means. D means uh, independent and identically distributed. So the setting is uh, you have a, a set of random variables, x1, xn, which are described by a joint density function, which is of the form P of x1, P, let's say, Px of x1, Px of xn. So the, the joint distribution of the n random variables is equal to the product of individual distributions for each random variables, which means that the random variables don't talk, don't talk to each other, and they individually follow the same distribution. Good. So we also define, so this is the probability density function for one single random variable. And associated to a probability density function, we can introduce the cumulative distribution function. call it f of x, which is basically the integral up to x of the PDF. So the cumulative distribution function uh, is basically equal to the probability that one, any of this random variable is takes value smaller or equal um, to x. Okay? Uh, and you obtain it by integrating the probability density function for all the values up to, to x. Okay, so we want to, can I uh, erase here? So this is the setting, and so in order to perform the calculation of the spacings, so what, what, I, what I'm after is the following thing. You have a certain domain on the, on the real axis, for example, the full, the full real axis, and you start throwing darts independently, okay? So you get like one here, one here, one here, and with, with a certain probability distribution, which is the same for every uh, toss, okay? And then after a certain number of, of tosses, you, you ask what is the distribution of the nearest neighbor uh, spacings between the tosses? Clearly, if, if you think about it, suppose that the PDF has this type of shape, okay? 
then this means that with high probability, you will always toss your dart around this region, right? the region where the PDF has its, its highest value. So it is highly likely that you will get a situation like this, a situation of clustering where all the darts just end up on the same region, which means that most likely the probability of having small spacing will be high, right? because, because the, 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 the tosses will cluster around the position where the PDF is, is higher. So this, this situation is markedly different from what, what we've seen in the case of random, random matrices, where two, two tosses would end up spaced apart. Is that clear? This is just an idea. We'll try to formalize it. Good. So in order to formalize it, we can define an object. Let's call it Pn. S, given that xj is equal to x. So this is a conditional PDF so given that one of the random variables let's say xj takes the value x. So this is a conditional probability, given that one of the random variables xj takes the values x, that there is another random variable, xk, so with k different from j, at the position x plus s. And no other variables in between. So what I'm saying is the following. We, we condition the probability to the fact that in the position x, you have one uh, so one, one dart has landed at the position x already. So it is there. Now we ask, given this fact, what is the probability that there is another dart which has landed at the position x plus s, and all the others have landed either to the left of x or to the right of x plus s? So there is an empty space in between. So the, the claim uh, is that, so I, I, I will give you the formula for this object, and then we'll try to, uh, to understand why it is like this. So the formula is like this. The probability density function of one single variable computed at x plus s times this object. Um, 1 plus f of x minus f of x plus s raised to the power n minus 2. So f of x is the uh, cumulative distribution function for each individual uh, random variable. So why is this formula true? We, we know that there is a, a random variable sitting at x. Okay, So we can forget about, about this one. It's, it, it is there. Now, we want a spacing of size s between two uh, random variables. So we want that another random variable has landed in the position x plus s. And this happens with probability p of x of x plus s. Okay. Just by definition, this is the probability density function of any random variable to land at x plus s. But this, and then we, we want this space to be empty. So we want the n minus 2 random variables that are remaining to be located either to the left of s of x or to the right of x plus s. So the probability, so f of x is the probability that any of, of these variables has landed to the left of x, because it is the cumulative distribution function. 
and 1 minus f of x plus s is 1 minus the cumulative distribution function, so it is the, the probability that this random variable has landed to the right of x plus s. And all this is true for all the remaining random variables, which are n minus 2, so we need to multiply the probability together. So this is the, so this is the, final, um, the final expression. This is an exact ex expression, which is valid for uh, any PDF and any number of uh, random variables. So it is, an, an, it is a completely exact uh, result. Okay? Note that this is not the object that I promised that we should, we should compute, okay? because this is a conditional PDF. We assume that one random variable is at, at x. We, we, we want now to lift this, this condition. We don't want any specific random variable to sit anywhere specifically. Okay? But, but this expression, uh, this way of, of proceeding is, is quite clear, at least to my, uh, to my eyes. Good. So now, how do we move uh, forward from, from here? Well, then we can, we can say, okay, from here, we can compute the probability, the conditional probability of having a spacing S, given that any of the X is at the position X, not just the, the Jth uh, random variable. Uh, and this one, we can compute it using the law of total probability, so this is the sum over all random variable of the probability we've just computed times the probability that xj is equal to x. Okay? So if, if we want any of the random variables to sit at x, not, not just the xj, then we need to sum over all the pos pos possible occurrences of this event for all the random variables, x1, x2, x, xn. But this calculation is, is simple because this probability is just the PDF, so it is px of x, and this summation just becomes, you know, we are summing uh, identical terms, so it just becomes a factor of n. So what we have here is n times p n s xj equal to x, which is the object we, we just computed, times the PDF of a single random variable. Okay. So now we are getting closer to the object we want, we want to, to compute, except that this is, we are still not done, because this is still a conditional probability. We have one guy sitting at x, which we, we don't want. We want to compute the histogram, no matter where the uh, initial particle is, the initial seed is. Well, so what shall we do? Any idea? Just to, to remove the x, to remove the dependence on, on x. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, okay. So how would you compute that? Okay, we're, we are very close, thanks to your inputs. So we, we are here now, this is still a conditional probability, and we have computed one of the crucial ingredients, which is, which is here. Now, all, all we have to do is to compute the spacing PDF, we can just integrate this conditional probability over x. Because the initial point can be anywhere, okay? Anywhere on the support of the original. So sigma is the support of your initial p, px of x. Okay? So in summary, so this is equal to n integral dx pn s given that xj is equal to x times the probability. So this is the probability, basically, that the first, the first dart has landed at the position x. So this is the completely general formula for the pro probability density function of the spacings between two consecutive random 
random variables, irrespective of where the first one was, um, the, the first one landed. Um, now it is uh, it is interesting. Uh, I haven't put it in the uh, in the handout. You can write like a short yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, um, this is, um, this is, uh, no, wait, um, no, I don't think so, right, because um, here, here you're saying that x, x, j, so one, one of the x's is staying at, at x, but you don't, you don't know which one, which one this is. You, you're, you're fixing one, but you don't know which one it is. So it can be number one, it can be number two, or it can be number n, and you've got n of them. Uh, n of them, not not n minus one. No, no, I mean uh, in the first expression, uh, the one for x, uh, s, yes, this one. This one. No. Uh, why? If we have a, if we have a certain uh, random variable at x, then we have a permutation of all random variables as well at x plus s. Well, you you are you are you are putting one at at x plus s, no matter which one which one this is, and then. And then the n minus two, I mean, you can do it with the with the permutation. With the then you would have a sum over with with a binomial coefficient, but you can you can show that this sum turns out to, you can resum this expression to get this this one. This is just a quicker a quicker way. Of course, you can you can compute the permutation because you can have the second one to the left and the fifth one to the right, or or you can change the two. So you would sum over the Binomial, you know, coefficient times blah blah, but then you can resum this expression to get exactly this this binomial. It's uh, if you if you expand this this binomial, you will you will see. Okay, so um, I haven't put it in the uh, in the handout, but actually this this final expression you can uh, now put uh, on on a computer, for for example in MATLAB, you can generate. Uh, random variables taken from, from from a Gaussian distribution or from an exponential distribution, you can compute the histogram of all the nearest neighbor uh, spacings, and then compare this object with this expression. For example, for exponential distribution, you can really compute these objects, and you can compute the integral analytically if you want. Okay, because uh, you, you just need to put this object in 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 here and perform just an extra an extra integration. And then you can you can really you, you can really see how the histogram and the theory would uh, would match. This is an exercise that that I suggest you to do. And if you are if you are interested, we can we can sit down and, and do it together at some at some point. In in MATLAB, it's really a, a, a one line for for exponential distribution. You sample random variables. You take the diff, and then you histogram the the diff, and then in this integral you can perform analytically. So. You will, you will find a perfect agreement between the theory. So this is the, the object we, we were after in the end, except that the expression is not really um, uh, informative. It is not as uh, evocative as, as the Wigner's, Wigner's surmise. So maybe we can do something uh, better here. So we can take the large n limit to find uh, a more uh, striking and universal result, which does not depend on the PDF of each single um, toss. In order to, to, oh, okay. So first of all, uh, this, this is a PDF, so it should be normalized. So I ask you, as an exercise, to check that if you compute this integral, it is correctly normalized to, to 1. This is a PDF, so it must be, it must be normalized. What's the area of the integral? It's just the domain of the So sigma... Sigma is the, uh, is the support of the individual PDF. So for example, if the, the PDF of each single random variable is exponential, then this integral would run from zero to infinity. If it is a Gaussian, it would run from minus infinity to plus infinity. If it is uniform zero, one, then it would run from zero to one. So the beauty of this derivation is that it does not depend in, so, so there is no, it's completely universal in the sense that it is valid for any PDF. 
any original PDF of your, of your random variables. You are not assuming that it is a Gaussian or an exponential. In fact, if, if it has, if, if it has a, a, a fault, it is that it is too general, probably. So that's why we are, we are trying to compute the large end limit to extract some universal, universal feature. So this is correct, but it is correct for everything. So we, we cannot really read off what, what it looks like if, if we were to plot it. Okay. But we are almost um, we are almost there, and then we can make a break. <clears throat> this is just to give you another uh, <clears throat> like a reference point. Yeah, sure. OK, so just, just do this uh, exercise. It is very instructive to show that, that your PDF is correctly normalized, the PDF of the, of the spacing. This is an exact result for any N and any PD, PDF. So it is a very strong, very strong result, very important, so important that you don't find it anywhere. Excellent. Good. So in order to extract some, uh, some information here, we want to make what is called a local, uh, yeah. local uh, change of variables. So I just write it, and then I explain what, what I mean. So I want to go from our random variable, or better, our variable s here, to another random variable that I write s hat over n px of x. So I want to measure the spacing between two consecutive uh, random variables in unit that are measured according to this uh, you know, unit length, which is capital N times the local PDF. So the PDF at the point x. So why are, we, why are we doing this? Because suppose that we have a lot of random variables. So we just toss a lot of darts. Okay. So clearly, if we toss a lot of darts, for example, in this domain, so if we toss two darts, the situation will be like this. We toss three, four, five, and then you know, we toss millions of darts. Then, as you may imagine, the typical spacings between two dots will go down, right? So the typical spacing between two dots, two tosses, goes down if n increases. But it also goes down if, around a certain position x, the probability of you know, throwing a dart there is, is high. Because in this, in this type of situation, then you will get many more tosses around here than you get here. Okay? So it is, it is natural to scale your spacing between two consecutive uh, tosses to make it clear that these two uh, objects, the number of tosses, and the local density of tosses are somehow washed out. So this is the idea of measuring the, the spacing in, in, in some units, taking out this, pu this curious effect of, of the fact that if you, if you toss too many dots or if the local profile of the, of the PDF is too high, then you would have smaller spacings, not, not because of, 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 this, of the fact that the spacing is intrinsically smaller, but just because you have too many tosses or too high a local density profile. Okay. So you want to take out this, this ingredient from, from, the, uh, from the problem. And you can do it uh, simply because this is just a change of variable. Okay? So a change of variable in uh, probability is performed like this. For example, we want to, going back to the conditional distribution, you know, the first object we, we computed, 
the conditional distribution that one of the uh, random variable xj was at position x, but this time we computed it. We computed uh, in terms of this new random variable of this new variable. Sorry, it's not a random variable. So we just take the formula we had before and we compute it on this uh, object. So the, the formula we had before was p of x of x plus s, and this becomes x plus s hat over n p x of x times 1 plus f of x minus f of x plus s hat over n p x of x to the power n minus 2. So I just, I just took the original formula that we derived, and I'm computing it in this new, in this new variable. Not s, but s hat over n times the probability density, the local one, which depends still on x. OK. And then what I do is I try to compute the, what happens for, for large n to this, to this formula, so if, if I throw a lot of dots. Then, uh, well, what I can do here is I can expand this object for large, for large n using a Taylor expansion. This will be f of x plus s hat over n p x of x, f prime of x, plus. And then you see that, that we are, we are uh, on something, because f of x cancels with, with this guy here. So this f of x and this f of x go away, because there's a minus sign here. And then we have 1 minus this object. So f prime of x is, it is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function, so it is the probability density function. So this object here cancels with this one. And what we are left with is 1 minus s hat over n to the power n minus 2, which goes to one minus s hat over n to the power n minus two for large n exponential of what? Positive or negative? Exponential of s hat, positive. So one minus s hat. Because if, if I add a plus here, yeah, so. Right? I'm almost done. So, uh, is everybody happy with this limit? One minus something divided by n to the power n? Coffee? <laughs> okay. So, I assume that we are all happy with this. And here, what's, what's happening here is if we retain just the, the first, the leading order in, in n, this is just px of x. So for large n, this object is just px of x times exponential or minus s hat. Okay, this is valid for large n, let's say. Okay, now we are basically done because we need to, yeah, we need to inject this object into this formula here to find what, what's happening in the case of uh, large n for the PDF of the spacing not conditioned on the position of any, of any particle. Okay, so if we do that, we have that, let's say, Pn hat of S hat. So this is the probability density function of the new variable, S hat, which is equal to the Pn 
of s equal to s hat over n px of x multiplied by ds over ds hat. This is the law of change of variables for probabilities. And if you do that by inserting this formula here, so we have n integral over dx px of x, which is this, this object here. Uh, then we have 1 over px of x, which comes from uh, here. There is also a factor 1 over n. So this factor 1 over n and this object here comes from this uh, derivative. And then we have an extra px of x, exponential of minus s hat, which comes from here. So this guy goes away with this guy. This guy goes away with this guy. dx, the integral of dx, px of x is equal to 1, because it is a normalized uh, PDF. So the final result is that in the scaling limit n to infinity, and much larger than 1, let's say, the space, the PDF of the spacings in unit of n px of x is just an exponential. So, which means that if we compare it, so, so, this one is the Wigner, Wigner surmise. This one is the scaled low for the uh, PDF of the spacings of IAD random variables. So you see that there is a massive difference in the region of small spacings. The Wigner surmise tells us that the eigenvalues don't like to stay too close to each other. For the case of IAD random variables, no matter what the PDF of each individual random variable is, so this is a completely universal result in the scaling, in the scaling limit, the probability of finding two particles very close to each other is the largest, actually. And, and the origin of this is the fact that if you have a certain PDF that is peaked around a certain point, most of your darts will fall in there. So they will cluster. They will not repel. So this, uh, this type of, of scheme is what is normally uh, called like the difference between Wigner-Dyson statistics and Poisson statistics. So Wigner-Dyson statistics is a, a fuzzy name for the statistics of, of stuff that repel. And Poisson statistics is the statistics of, of stuff that, that attract each other. You know. Of course, that's another example of a badly probably badly designed name, because Poisson statistics has nothing to do with a Poisson distribution. Okay? It is the distribution of a Poisson process, which is an entirely different, an entirely different thing. Okay? But as, as we can see, uh, this derivation uh, has nothing to do with stochastic processes. It is a completely you know, universal first principle uh, derivation, which does not require any assumption on the specific PDF of the individual random variables. Yeah? Excellent question. The Wigner surmise in the form I, I gave you, so s exponential minus s square over 4 or, uh, or whatever, is only valid for a 2 by 2 Gaussian random, random matrix. So it, it is strictly valid in the setting I gave you. The essential features are valid for general n, so the fact that the eigenvalues repel. So if you are asking, OK, suppose that I take an n by n Gaussian matrix, not a 2 by 2, so exactly as I gave you, but 3 by 3 or 4 by 4, can we compute the distribution? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the formula becomes, uh, well, it is exact, but not very, uh, very useful. It is given in terms of an infinite uh, product of uh, eigenvalues of a certain Fredholm determinant operator. 
So the formula is so complicated that actually you can only evaluate it uh, numerically. But we can, uh, in principle, we, we, have, we have a formula for, for it. But the essential features are the same. And actually what, what people claim is that the Wigner surmise for a two by two is an excellent approximation for the spacing of, of larger, larger n uh, matrices. So there is a deviation of a few percent close to the, close to the top. But essentially, it is, a very good, it is a very good approximation. But strictly speaking, it is not true that the Wigner surmise holds for, for larger matrices. Well, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the fact is that what you're, what you're doing is uh, you're saying, uh, I want to uh, separate two effects. The fact that the two random variables want, want to stay close, uh, closer to each other, and the fact that they are forced to stay close to each other just because there are too many of them, or they need to all to land there just because the probability distribution is, is larger. So in some sense, you want to unfold your set of random variables and make sure that, that they are stretched in such a way that their mean level spacing is equal to one across the spectrum. Okay? So you want to, to make particles that are too close to each other, not because they wanted to be there, but just because there are too many of them. Or because of the, dens of the local density there is larger than the local density. So you want to make the local density somehow uniform across the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. And you want to calculate this on that. Yeah, exactly. So you calculate you calculate the spacing such that after you have made the the density of your particles uniform, so you are basically washing out the the fact that two particles are need to be too close to each other, not because they want they want to, but just because there are too many of them. Is that sort of clear? Okay. So. Um, well, that's time for um, for a break. Yeah. Should we start again. Good. So uh, <clears throat> we've seen uh, something about uh, eigenvalues of uh, random matrices. Then we um, we went uh, one step. Uh, back to the situation of IAD random variables. Now we come back to the um, to the um, topic of uh, random matrices. So what I wanted to do now is to offer um, you what I call a, a layman um, classification. Of um, random matrix. Um, models. Again, this is something uh, which I believe is, is very important. It is so important that you don't find it on, on textbooks. That's, that's the, usual, uh, the usual thing. So this is my second gift of the day. Uh, <clears throat> So what, why I call it uh, a layman classification? Because if you Google classification of random matrix models, then you get into a domain of mathematical physics, and uh, it becomes increasingly and immediately uh, very complicated. I just wanted to give you like a, a map, conceptual map, to uh, find your way on this uh, field without getting too much um, tangled in, in technicalities. So we have uh, matrices, let's say, n by n. Which are characterized by a certain joint probability density of the entries. So uh, in, in this, uh, uh, this series of lectures, 
I will impose a requirement and uh, the, the requirement is that uh, X has a real spectrum. So the eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda n are real. If this is not true, then we have a second branch of random matrix uh, theory, which would take me probably the same number of hours to, to discuss, so I, don't, I just don't have, don't have time. So we will discuss only matrices with real spectrum, so eigenvalues that are real. The entries can be complex, not only that, they can be also something else, but the eigenvalues must be real numbers. And, uh, well, actually, to be even more uh, restrictive, uh, X, we will take it as belonging to one of, of these three classes. So X can be real symmetric. So the entries will be real number, and the matrix will be symmetric. This ensures that the spectrum is, is real by the fundamental theorem of algebra. And to real symmetric matrices, we will associate a number beta equal to 1. Okay? So when I will talk about beta 1 ensembles, we make, I mean, I, I will mean matrices that are real and symmetric. Okay? Beta is, is called Dyson index of the ensemble. Okay? Just the definition. Or they can be complex Hermitian beta equals to 2. Complex Hermitian, so a matrix with complex entries, which is Hermitian. Now, give me an example of a 2 by 2 complex Hermitian matrix. Sorry? Yes. Another one. <laughs> what do I put here? Sorry? Zero? Okay. What do I put here? Minus I. What do I put here? Okay. So, or you can have like Okay. So, an Hermitian matrix is a matrix with complex uh, entries which has real entries on the diagonal and complex conjugate entries on the off diagonal. Okay? I'm sure everybody knew this, but you know, maybe not. Good. Or it can be, uh, X can be, can have quaternion elements. It can be a quaternion self-dual matrix, which I personally hate, so I will not discuss, I will not discuss that. But you can have matrices with quaternion uh, elements, which are characterized by uh, Dyson index beta equal to 4. Okay, for the beta equals to 3 case, then you will need to look up Frobenius theorem on division algebras. which uh, will tell you uh, why we have real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, but we cannot have ternions. Okay? So we cannot, we cannot define a division algebra with three uh, imaginary units. Okay? So we will only need uh, to deal with, with this uh, 
three cases, which are beta equals one, two, and, and four. Okay, now, uh, if, uh, if this is the uh, universe we are, uh, we are working on, which, is not, uh, which does not exhaust all the possibilities, but it is just to be Now, this is the universe that we are working on, the universe of random matrices that belong to these uh, categories, real spectrum. Now, within this uh, universe, we have two classes of random matrices that are uh, of paramount uh, importance. So we can, we can draw a diagram like, like this. So the first, uh, the first class of random matrices uh, lies here. It is the matrix, matrices characterized by independent entries. So here we have uh, random matrices whose joint distribution of the entries factorizes into the product of individual distributions, one for each entry. So the P of, let's say, x11, xnn, is equal to a certain p11, x11, times pnn, xnn, okay? Modulo, of course, the symmetry, the symmetry requirement. So if we have like a real symmetric matrix, matrix, then we only need to consider the upper triangle because all the remaining random variables are, are just defined automatically by the symmetry. Uh, requirement. Okay, so independent entries, this is a, a, a nice class of, of random matrices characterized by this, uh, this property. The second, uh, the second class of uh, important random matrices to consider, um, well, the, the defining property is a bit less uh, obvious to, to define. Uh, I will try to do my best. <coughs> so the second category is called a rotational, they are characterized by rotational invariance. So rotational invariant models. They are characterized by this, um, by this property, that P of x, uh, dx11, dxnn, so the joint distribution of the entries of, of these matrix models is equal to P of x prime, dx11 prime, dxnn prime, if x prime is equal to ux u minus one. So this is the definition. Now I'll, I'll try to, to explain what, what this means. So we have one matrix x, in the ensemble, we perform some sort of similarity transformation or our rotation, and we obtain another random matrix. And this random matrix has the same statistical weight as, as the previous one. So the two matrices occur in the ensemble with the same probability. Okay, so this is, this is a, a very um, involved uh, properties because it, it involves like a non-local transformation of all the entries. Okay. If, you, if you imagine to write the entry ij of x prime in terms of the entry ij of x, well, it will involve all the entries of, of x. Okay. So it is a very complicated transformation property of the joint distribution such that it turns out, after all this operation has been, has been made, that the probability distribution of one one random matrix and the rotated version of it are the same, no matter what the rotation matrix is. So it is a, it is a pretty strong uh, constraint. Okay, I will, I will show you like with a few examples uh, how, how this um, um, is, is put in, in, into practice. Now, you've seen uh, here that I put like an intersection between these two uh, classes. So you might wonder, okay, what, um, what lies 
in the uh, intersection. And, th and here the, the story becomes quite, um, quite interesting. So first of all, <clears throat> remember that X can be, could be real symmetric, complex Hermitian, or quaternion self-dual. So if X is real symmetric, then U is an orthogonal matrix. If X is complex Hermitian, then U will be a unitary matrix. And if X is quaternion self-dual, then U will be a symplectic matrix, which, by the way, I also hate due to the fact that I hate the original one. OK. <clears throat> Questions? Sorry, uh, you can't read, probably. So if, uh, here, if X is real symmetric, then U will be an orthogonal matrix. If X is complex Hermitian, U will be a unitary matrix. And if X is quaternion self-dual, then U will be a symplectic matrix. Excellent. You don't need to know. I will absolutely don't waste not even three minutes of my life describing what a symplectic matrix is, because it's a total mess and it's completely boring. But I'm happy to discuss it later. OK? Sorry. It's just that I really am. It gives, it gives me physical pain. To... I'm just joking. But I have more, more interesting stuff to, to tell you. So that's, that's why. OK? Good. Um, but there is a, uh, an interesting point here. Uh, you see this uh, invariance uh, property. So X, this, you have this matrix X, you rotate it, and, and the ro rotate version of, of this matrix has the same statistical weight as, as the first one. So what, what does this mean in terms of the eigenvectors of the two, of the two matrices? You see, if, if by rotating it like once or twice or three times, you don't change the, the statistical weight. This basically means that the eigenvectors of, of this type of ensembles are not that important, right? They are, they are not important because a, a, a rotation by a matrix that contains the eigenvector of it would leave the statistical weight unchanged no matter what type of rotation, so what type of eigenvectors you have. Okay. So this this class of random matrix models is interesting because the eigenvectors are not that important. The eigenvectors don't, don't play a very, uh, very interesting role because you can always rotate it, so forget about the, the original eigenvectors and go to another basis and you leave the statistical weight un unchanged. Okay, so there is nothing specific about that specific set of eigenvectors of the matrix X because by rotating it, you are washing out all the information about the eigenvectors and still the statistical weight remains the same, okay? So in, for this class, class of models, the eigenvectors are not important. For this class of models, the eigenvectors are very important, okay? Why? Because the joint probability density is factorized. This property depends on which basis you are in. If you, if you make a change of, if you make a rotation in the space of matrices here, it will no longer, in general, be true that the joint distribution of the rotated matrix will have this factorization property. There's no reason to believe that this should be the case, right? So, so the, the pro here you see the interplay between probability theory and linear algebra. Here we have a property that is a probability property, probabilistic property, that the joint density factorizes. But this property is intertwined to the algebraic property that you have this specific eigen set, this specific eigenspace. If you change, if you make a rotation, then it will no longer be true in general that distribution of the entries will factorize. This is, this is the beauty of, of random matrix theory, that you have this interplay between algebraic properties, the, the eigenspace, and probabilistic properties. That you have this factorization only in this eigenspace. 
this this p let's say this this p of p of x and p of x prime so the joint distribution so the joint distribution of the entries is unchanged so if you look at the two you cannot spot the difference between the previous one and the new one okay now uh, we wanted to to understand what is in uh, in the intersection here uh, i'll give you a hint based on our first And then I'll conclude. We can resume later. And the hint is the very first calculation that we did. Remember, we did a calculation for a real symmetric matrix, two by two. And the probability density, the joint probability density, of this object was the product of three Gaussians. Remember? Remember, the, the very first example we had, we had independent Gaussian variables, but the off-diagonal element had a variance that was one half the variance of the diagonal element. So the joint probability density is the product of three Gaussians. Now, we, we can rewrite this object as 1 over 2 pi root pi exponential minus 1 half x1 square plus x2 square plus 2 Again, this factor of 2, x3 squared. Now, this object, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus 2x3 squared. Can we rewrite it in a more clever way? Yeah. yeah. So this object here is the trace of x squared. Just do it, x1, x2, x3, x3. You multiply it by x1, x2, x3, x3. So you find x1 square plus x3 square, x1, x3 plus x3, x2, x1, x3 plus x3, x2, x1 square plus x3 square. And if you take the trace, this guy plus this guy, reconstruct the factor of 2 that we, we have here. So this object here, so the, the joint distribution of the entries of, your, of our matrix, we can write it in terms of the trace of x squared. And now, bingo. So we started off from uh, a matrix in this, in, in this uh, region, because it has independent entries. But we have rewritten the, the joint distribution of the entries in terms of the trace of x squared. So if we now perform a rotation in the space of x, this, the p of x prime becomes proportional of exponential one half trace of u x u transpose square. And this guy here is exactly equal to exponential minus one half trace of x square. So by performing a rotation, in the space of matrices, we have left the uh, original weight unchanged. And this only because of this factor of 2, again. If this factor of 2 was not there, then we couldn't have written the, uh, the joint distribution of the entries in terms of traces. Okay? So this hint tells you that this type of matrices lies in the intersection. So it has independent entries, but it has also the, rotation, the property of rotational invariance. So if you have a P of X that is proportional to exponential of minus one half trace of X squared, this lies in the intersection. It has independent entries, but also the property of rotational invariance. So now the question is, are there other models in the, in the intersection? 
and unfortunately, uh, the answer is negative. So there is uh, a, a theorem, which is a theorem by uh, Rosenzweig and Porter, a very old, uh, old theorem. You can find it reproduced on page um, 6 and 7 of the, of the handout. So it is published in a, in a basically unknown Finnish, Finnish journal. So in this, uh, this theorem um, is basically proving that the only ensemble that has independent entries and rotational invariance is the Gaussian ensemble. So an ensemble of this form for any n. Okay. This is this bad, bad news, right? It means that you have to make a choice. If you want to have independent entries, you will lose typically rotational invariance. If you want to have rotational invariance, then the resulting ensemble will typically not have independent entries. There is only one ensemble in the, in the intersection. Page six and seven of the handout. Okay, I think it's, um, it's time to wrap things uh, up and um, we'll continue uh, today at 2.30, right? Okay, thank you.